Well, as always, it's very good to see everybody here this evening. Scripture clearly explains that God does have knowledge of future events. And not just in a prognosticatory way. It's not just that He predicts future events, uh, that He guesses or has at least even an, an educated estimation of what the future is going to be like. Scripture clearly explains that God knows the future. Consider a couple of examples here as we get our lesson started. Psalm 139. Now I know on the screen it says verse 4, but let's actually go to Psalm 139 and let's read a few additional verses. Let's start in verse 1 and we'll go through verse 6. So I like the context here of Psalm 139, but notice what the writer says in Psalm 139. O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou dost know when I sit down and when I rise up. Thou dost understand my thought from afar. Thou dost scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Verse 4 specifically. Even before there was a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, Thou dost know it all. Thou hast enclosed me behind and before and laid Thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. I appreciate the sentiment that he offers there. He acknowledges that God has amazing knowledge that is too high for Him, too big for Him. And maybe that's something that we ought to practice a little bit more is respecting the sanctity of the knowledge of God. Maybe instead of always trying to know what God knows, maybe we should just respect that there are things God knows that we do not and will not and cannot ever know. Maybe even until we get to the afterlife, there are things we'll not understand about God. In Isaiah 46 and verse 10, it is written, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done. Which is interesting considering the context. A couple chapters earlier, in Isaiah 44 and verse 28 through the end of that chapter, who does he mention there at the end of Isaiah 44? None other than Cyrus, the shepherd of his people, somebody that God specifically called by name 150 years before he even existed. Even if we could dismiss the Psalms or Isaiah as nothing but poetic language explaining God's vast knowledge, what do we do with specific instances where God shows that He knows exactly how the future will unfold? Think of a few examples here. We'll just rattle them off. You can write them down and look at them on your own time if you'd like to. But in Mark chapter 15 and verse 30, Jesus knew that Peter would deny Him three times on a specific night. In John 6 and verse 64, He knew that Judas was going to betray Him. And that's not the only time, by the way, that He makes it clear that He knows exactly what Judas is planning on doing to Him. In Luke chapter 9, verse 22, or Mark 10, verses 33 and 34, He knows exactly what the Pharisees, the Jews, and the Romans are going to do with the knowledge that Judas gives to them. In Mark chapter 14, verses 13 through 15, He shows that He knows very minute details about certain situations that He would not even witness in person. One reason that it is possible for God to understand all things is that He does not exist within the realm of time. God lives outside the boundaries of time, so to speak. Consider a couple of analogies. We'll use a, a, an illustration here maybe to help us understand how does God's foreknowledge work, especially really the direction we're going with this lesson is how does God's foreknowledge work while still acknowledging that we have free will in this universe because I think you can see where we're going with that here perhaps in a certain sense God's foreknowledge is kind of like a lab technician and they're studying the way that mice or rats are going to respond to a maze and given certain stimulation within that maze inside the maze all the rat can see are the walls around him he has no idea what's on the other side of all of those walls the rat doesn't even know what's around the next corner and yet the lab technician because he exists outside the context of that maze can see the whole maze as it is we see everything as a sequence of events we are temporal beings we're time-bound creatures everything happens after this or before this and there's nothing else that can possibly happen outside of those two things. It's either before it 
or after it. We are time-bound creatures that see things in a sequence of events. God exists outside the sequence of events. We know from a great verse in the New Testament, in 2 Peter 3 and verse 8, notice what Peter writes there. In 2 Peter 3 and verse 8, But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. To him, time is immaterial because he doesn't exist in time. We were studying in Bible class this morning, if you recall, in Revelation chapter 4, part of the song that they're singing in that throne scene in Revelation chapter 4. Look at verse 8 of Revelation 4. This is what the four creatures are singing. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God the Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And He's all of those things at the same time. He is pre-existent currently existing and always existing. Time is immaterial to a God who exists outside the bounds of time. So for him, knowing future events is as simple as knowing past events to us. Perhaps another way to look at it, and I think this is a little bit more optimistic, I don't like to think of my life as being stuck in a rat's maze. So the analogy that I like to use, and Thomas Aquinas also used this, the theologian, he said that God is almost like someone at the top of a hill or at the top of a mountain. And He's looking down upon travelers following a path. Now, the man on the top of the mountain can see exactly where that trail is going. He can see around the next bend, over the next hill. He knows what's coming on that trail because he has the perspective that affords him that knowledge. Now, the person on the trail, the person tinkering around down at the bottom of the hill, surrounded by trees or rocks or who is prevented by a hill from seeing what's beyond uh, the next one, he does not have that perspective. And so God sees, again, He sees the sequence of events laid out, whereas we are bound by time and bound by perspective. We don't see things as God sees them. Now still, let's acknowledge something. Even those two analogies do not suffice when it comes to understanding and explaining the foreknowledge of God in future events. You can be at the top of a mountain and you can watch a man hiking along this trail and you can guess what will happen next. You can assume what will happen next. And you might have a very educated guess about what happens next. You could see a puma down on one part of the trail and a man walking toward that puma, and you can guess what's going to happen next. It's still a guess. With God, it is not about guesswork, even educated guesswork. God didn't guess that Cyrus would come along 150 years after the time of Isaiah and release the Israelites from their captivity. God didn't guess that a man named Cyrus would come along and do what he did. He didn't guess the 70 years after Jeremiah's time when they would be released from their captivity. That wasn't guesswork on his part. He didn't guess which kingdoms were going to come along in the visions of Nebuchadnezzar as Daniel interprets them. He didn't guess what the golden head was all the way down to the feet. He didn't guess all of that. So even these analogies of a rat's maze in a lab or a man observing people hiking on a trail, even those analogies are not sufficient when it comes to the foreknowledge of God. Which, of course, leads to our next question. Does God's foreknowledge neutralize our free will? We love our free will, don't we? I think that's both a tenet of Western Christianity in the broad sense and a tenet of Western philosophical thinking that we cherish very much is free will. We are self-determining creatures. And the idea of a God who already knows what's going to happen before it happens is almost repugnant to people like us. So does His foreknowledge neutralize our free will? Well, I like the way that one writer put it. In a book called That's Just Your Interpretation, one writer said it very well. God's knowledge of future actions does not by itself hinder human freedom since knowledge doesn't actually cause anything. I thought that was a really interesting way of putting it. So we can have God's foreknowledge and still have human will. 
Because his foreknowledge doesn't cause anything to happen. Just because he knows what will happen doesn't mean that it's his fault that it happens. And I think a lot of times, philosophically, people get those two things mixed up. When we talk about God's foreknowledge, the very next step that people say is, so God has predetermined everything in advance, huh? So God knows when you're going to get cancer and He chooses not to prevent it, huh? So God knows exactly when you're going to lose your job. So God, and we kind of make this, this philosophical leap from knowing how things turn out to being the responsible one for how things turn out. It suddenly becomes God's fault when bad things happen to us. And I don't think that that's a very logical jump to make. Let's give some examples of this, some, some practical examples. First of all, death. We all know death is going to happen. We have knowledge of death, don't we? And we don't know exactly when or how or where we're going to die. None of us really do. Not even the suicidal or the capital criminal knows exactly when and how he or she is going to die. And yet we know death is going to happen. I don't know when, but I know it will happen someday. And yet does my knowledge of death cause my death? By knowing that I'm going to die someday, does that cause my death to happen someday? No. Clearly not. Let's take another one. Judgment Day. We are given plenty of information in the Bible about Judgment Day. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says that it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. So you know, no excuses anybody, you know that you're going to face judgment after you die. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. There is a sequence of events that is explained there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So we know what's going to happen. We know a judgment day will occur. And yet, does our knowledge of the judgment day cause the judgment day? No. Because it goes on to say in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that it is a time that we will not even know. We can know about the judgment day, but we can't cause the judgment day to happen. We can know about the judgment day, but it's not like we can expect it to happen on our schedule, on our timetable. Otherwise, we could cause it to happen. We could delay it. We could hasten it somehow by our knowledge of it. No, but as you can see from just those two examples alone, knowledge of a future event is not necessarily the cause of a future event. Now, a number of scriptures in the Bible indicate that God has the ability to know various outcomes depending on how people respond to the situation. I think this is maybe a good way of explaining to people how you can meld foreknowledge and free will into the same conversation. God gives us entire free will. We know that from the law. We know it from the book of Deuteronomy. I presented to you this day the blessing and the curse. So choose life this day and not the curse. He's given us the choice. You remember what Joshua said in his famous words, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Hey, you choose who you want to serve. Choose this day. Serve God or serve the idols, but I'm going to choose to serve God. It's our choice, and God gives us that free will. But God also knows what would happen if. If I choose to go down this path versus going down this path... So I like this. Maybe a better way of putting it, it's not that God knows the future. It's that God knows various futures. God knows all of the futures, depending on what we choose to do with the stimulus given to us. Consider an example here. In 1 Samuel chapter 23, let's go to 1 Samuel 23. And notice the situation here, and as it turns out. After rescuing the people of Keilah from the Philistines, David decides to take refuge in their city for a time. And remember, at this time, David is fleeing from his father-in-law, Saul. Saul is uh, trying to kill him at this time period. So here in 1 Samuel chapter 23, David takes refuge in the city of the people of Keilah for a time period. When Saul realizes that that's where David is... He pursues him. He sees the opportunity to lay a trap for David. Fearing that the people of Keilah might betray him, David asks God 
What will happen? Notice here in verses 11 and 12. Will the men of Keilah surre uh, surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down just as thy servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell thy servant. And look what the Lord answers. He will come down. Verse 12. So David said, Will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will surrender you. God knows future events, does He not? He says, in plain language, the men of Keilah will surrender you. With that knowledge, David then makes a choice. David takes control of the situation. He seizes, with his free will, upon an opportunity to escape the men of Keilah. Rather than staying in their city and becoming the prey of Saul, he actually leaves their city. With that knowledge... So it's interesting, isn't it? That God clearly says the men of Keilah will surrender you to Saul. David leaves and never even gives them the opportunity. So was God wrong when he predicted the future and said, oh, the men of Keilah, they will surrender you. Was he wrong in that prediction? Or was it that God knew every single option? He knew all the plan B's he knew all the contingencies. It is that if David had stayed in Keilah, they would have surrendered him to Saul and he would have become Saul's prisoner. But he chose to leave with that knowledge. I think that's important to understand here that God knows all of the options. He knows all the plan B's and all of the contingencies. Let's look at another example here. In the prophet Jonah. Let's go to Jonah and look at a couple things here in Jonah real quick. Okay? Let's notice in the story of Jonah, of course you all know the story really, really well. Uh, we've, we've known it since childhood. Go to Jonah chapter 3 and verse 4. Look at Jonah 3 and verse 4. He's finally at Nineveh. You know, the, the stink of fish breath all over his clothes. He's finally at Nineveh. Jonah 3 and verse 4, it says, Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now, of course, we have to understand that's Jonah speaking quite hopefully, but that's also a prophet of God here speaking by the power of God. No, uh, Jonah said exactly what God wanted him to. I think we need to acknowledge that. The first three verses make it very clear that Jonah finally gives in and says, okay, what do you want me to say to Nineveh? And God says, you'll go to Nineveh and you'll tell them exactly what I tell you to say. And part of that message is, Yet 40 days and Nineveh not could be, not might be, not might otherwise be, but he says in no uncertain terms in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. What happens in 40 days though? Was Nineveh overthrown? No, the people of Nineveh repent of their sins and sackcloth and ashes. The leader of Nineveh declares a fast for the whole city. They're weeping and crying to God for forgiveness. And God forgives them. Yet 40 days and Nineveh was not overthrown. So again, you see, just like with the story of David and the men of Keilah, God knows what will happen if. If the men of Nineveh do not repent, 40 days will come by and the city will be destroyed. If the men of Nineveh do repent, 40 days will come by and they will be forgiven. Their city will be left to them whole not in pieces as He had promised. God knows all of the contingencies. Go to Jeremiah 18. Before we leave this point and move on to another idea here, let's go to Jeremiah 18. Because I think Jeremiah explains exactly what we're talking about here in, in really, really plain language. Notice Jeremiah 18, beginning in verse 7. At one moment, God says through Jeremiah... I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, to pull down, or to destroy it. If that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent. Other translations say, I will repent. I will change my thinking, change my mind about them. Concerning the calamity that I had planned to bring upon it. Of course, he goes on to say that the flip side is the same way as well. Whether I've planned to bring calamity or good things, 
Whatever the plan is for that city, that plan can be flipped upside down on its head depending on what human free will does as a response. God might have a plan for the future. We could acknowledge that. But God might all just have foreknowledge of future events that He didn't even cause. Either way, either way, God's foreknowledge is the sort of thing that knows what will happen if. Now, some people will say that if God knows past and future truths, then both sets of truths are logically the same in that they are locked in place. The future is just as unpreventable as the past. But besides being counterintuitive, such a fatalistic position is simply not true. By definition, we cannot act on or cause anything in the past. That would be backward causation. We simply have no power over it, whereas we can act in the present to bring about future events. And, you know, I was kind of thinking about this, and I think that's absolutely true what the writer is saying. But, you know, I, this got me thinking. Are we really that bound by the past either? I know we can't change past events, but I think it's really interesting how fatalistic people tend to be fatalistic in both directions. They tend to see themselves as trapped by the mistakes of their past, and thus their future is going to be colored by that. They're bound by the past, so they know how their future is going to turn out because they're stuck. I've made too many mistakes. I'm too far gone. I had a bad upbringing. I had a bad father. I was in an abusive relationship. I'm an alcoholic. I'm an addict. Fill in the blank, whatever it is. And we feel like we are so stuck by our past events that the future is now also just as fatalistic. And we, we tend to have this attitude that both sets, like the writer says, both sets of truths are unpreventable. You can't change the past. You can't change the future. And what a miserable way to live. You know, but the more you think about it, at least in, in Bible terms, I, I almost see the past as just as boundless as the future. When you become a Christian, are you bound by anything in the past? Now, I know that there's still consequences that we might face. It's not like you can become a Christian and get baptized and and uh, you, know, you don't have to go to prison for things that you've gotten away with in the past or something. That's not what I'm saying at all. Like you can be a jewel thief in the past, become a Christian, then keep all of your loot. That's not at all what I'm saying. You don't have to be bound, though, by the lifestyles. You don't have to be bound by the guilt. You don't have to be bound by the choices that you made in the past. Your future is wide open. Why? Because your past is the past. Your past has no bearing on who you should be right now. We have all kinds of excuses. Well, I am that way because my dad was that way. I've got a bad temper because of this or that. I'm miserable because of my choices at work, because of a bad boss. We've got a whole litany of excuses that we offer of why we are who we are, why we feel so fatalistic about the future. We have all the excuses in the world. And yet God is calling us through the gospel to lay the excuses down and not be the kinds of people who you think you have to be, but to be the kinds of people who you are called to be through His Word. That's Ephesians 4, isn't it? We've looked at Ephesians 4 several times in the last few months, haven't we? Ephesians 4 is all about taking the old creature, getting rid of it, killing it, setting it aside, and moving on to the new creature. If you stole before, stop stealing and labor with your hands. If you used to curse, stop cursing and praise God. If you were a liar before, quit lying and tell the truth. No, we are not bound by the past. We're not bound by the future either. You know what we're bound by? We're bound by an obligation to our Creator who tells us what we should be. How we should use our free will as we move forward each and every single day of our lives. Now the last point that we'll look at. How does God's foreknowledge actually free us? Because a lot of people look at God's foreknowledge and think that it's confining. Like... Well, if God already knows what's going to happen, then 
really, what can we do to prevent it? We kind of kind of get afraid of the future because of that. And, you know, I, I can understand that. I can understand it. If you're sitting and watching a movie with someone who already knows how the ending goes, they're just sitting there all smug, aren't they? And that's uncomfortable. Nobody, nobody wants to watch Inception with someone who knows how the movie ends, right? Nobody wants to sit and watch Braveheart. They're like, well, this is a, I, I, think, I think this could turn out okay for Mel Gibson. No, nobody wants to sit and watch Braveheart with someone who knows how the movie's going to turn out. So I can understand. I, I understand that God's foreknowledge is an intimidating factor when trying to understand a relationship with Him. But rather than being something that constrains us or makes us uncomfortable, let's see all of the ways that His foreknowledge actually releases us from the bounds of this life. First of all, we know His judgment is coming. God has already told humanity that He is coming to judge. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 9 and 10, we will all stand before the judgment seat and be judged for the deeds that we have done in the flesh, whether good or evil. Romans chapter 14, verses 11 and 12, every single one of us is going to bow our knees before God on that great and terrible day. We know that judgment is coming. Rather than being terrified of the impending judgment, we should use that as great motivation to live how we ought to live. Look at Galatians 5 and verse 13. The writer of Galatians says that we have great freedom. And I think that great freedom comes from great knowledge. We know what's going to happen. We know there is a judgment day that's coming. Yet look at what he says to do with your freedom. You have free will. You have freedom offered you in Christ. What should you do with it? Galatians 5 verse 13 for you were called to, uh, to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Where's the motivation? The motivation is to serve one another through love. I know the judgment day is coming, and I know I'm going to be judged based on what I do in the body. I know that a great book is going to be open to me. The book of Revelation makes that very clear. A great book will be opened to me, and I will be judged based on what God finds in that book under chapter Ryan. So what am I doing with that life? Is that knowledge motivating me? If it isn't, it should be. We already know the standard, too. What does John 12 and verse 48 say? John 12, verse 48, out of Jesus' own mouth, He says, there is one thing that's going to judge this world. What is it? My word. My word is what will judge this world. So we know the standard. You want to know how you're going to be judged? You already have the answer key right here. You're not going into the SATs without some kind of knowledge. You're not taking your driver's test without having something to work with. You have the answer sheet right here. Jesus Himself said, you will be judged by a standard. That standard is my word. So there's no surprises also. We're not going to get to the judgment day and God's going to go, so you didn't see the last chapter, did you? Oh, I forgot to put that one in there. There's nothing that God's going to say to us on the judgment day where He's just going to be like, whoops, my bad. Forgot to tell you about that one. No, no surprises on the judgment day. Standard that's already been revealed to us. We already know the means to salvation. Mark 16, verse 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. And notice that Jesus says that in a predictive sort of language. God's foreknowledge? Sure. You know what God's foreknowledge says about who's going to be saved? God knows exactly who's going to be saved. He knows exactly who's going to be saved. Everybody who believes and is baptized will be saved. Everybody who does not believe will be condemned. That's God's foreknowledge at work there for you. What are you going to do with that? The very fact that God reaches out to us means that He believes that some of us will be saved. I think that we need to be careful not to regard His confidence in us so lightly. The very fact that God gave us the Bible, the very fact that God sent His Son to us, the very fact that God says, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, is basically His hand reaching out to us going, I know you guys can do it. I believe you can be saved. 
well, wait a minute, I thought God's foreknowledge was fatalistic. I thought God's foreknowledge meant that we should all just give up because it's all been decided already. You know what? If God's foreknowledge means that we're predestined to one path or the other, then why does He reach out to us every day and practically beg us to accept the gospel? The very fact that God reaches out to us means He believes each and every one of us can be saved. He doesn't believe that we all will be, but He believes that we all can be saved. And that's not predestination. God's foreknowledge is not a weapon that He uses against us. It is a weapon that He uses for us. Think of it this way. You have got a guy on your side. I say guy in the lightest possible terms, of course. You have someone on your side who knows everything. Let that sink in for a second, okay? It's just kind of like, let that sink in. You have a God on your side who knows everything. You think He can help you find salvation? You think that in His knowledge, in His vast, immeasurable, unfathomable wisdom, that He can find a way for you to be saved? Rather than seeing God's foreknowledge as something that's, that's scary or, or intimidating, let's see God's foreknowledge as the ultimate tool to our advantage. Notice 1 Peter 1, verse 19. Should it surprise us that God is watching out for us the way He is? Everything that God has done up until this point has been for our benefit. Why should anything change after that? Why is anything that God does for us in the future going to be different than everything He's done for us in the past? In 1 Peter 1, verse 19, it says, For He was foreknown. Who is He talking about there? Jesus. The Son of God. The Messiah. For He was foreknown before the foundation of the world but He has appeared in these last times. Why? For your sake. I love the way that verse brings the two things together. You have God's foreknowledge on the one hand because Jesus was foreknown before the foundation of the world. And yet, in that foreknowledge, there's God working on your behalf to save you. Jesus was foreknown Jesus came by a predetermined plan, predestiny, for our sakes. And again, that leads back to that point we were saying just a minute ago. God's foreknowledge is not a weapon He uses against us. It is a weapon He uses greatly to our advantage. How else would she, should we view it then? God knows how your life is going to turn out. It doesn't mean He caused your life to turn out that way, but He's looking at you going, that person is heading down a path. That person is walking down a trail. And I'm up on the mountain. I see where that path is going. I see how today's mistake is going to hurt them tomorrow. And I see how today's repentance is going to bring them great relief in the future. God sees the path you're on. He knows how your life is going to turn out. If you choose to become a Christian this evening, He knows exactly how your life is going to turn out. Heaven. If you choose to reject Him. If you choose to go on living ignorantly, selfishly. God also knows exactly how that life is going to turn out. And my friends, it is inevitable. A life that is based on selfishness and self-will is a life that is leading to condemnation for all eternity. God is reaching out to you. He said, man, I'm seeing the way your life is turning out. I see the path you've chosen. Maybe it's time to choose a different path. Time to choose a different path. Whatever need you might have, please come forward as we stand and sing.